the real reason why people buy into the story, even if it is utterly absurd, is not because they believe in the narrative. It is because the narrative leads to the new social bond. That's the real reason. Welcome everyone to this show. I am your host, Dr. Chris Martinson, and today's show is going to be one of the most important you'll watch this year. I've spent pretty much the past two years covering the science of COVID. Well, today we're going to cover the psychology of COVID, more specifically, the ways in which many societies and cultures around the world, principally countries holding Western values, I've noticed, have overreacted, have underreacted, and have sometimes even dangerously fallen into what might be called mass psychosis or more accurately, mass formation. During such moments, mental health declines. Societies can do great harm to themselves and to others as they irrationally overreact to perceived and sometimes entirely imaginary threats. Today's guest is Professor Matthias Desmet of Ghent University, who is one of the leading expert voices on this specific topic. In addition to being a lecturing professor in clinical psychology at Ghent University, he holds a master's degree in statistics. Professor Desmond, I know you're a busy man these days. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and welcome to the show. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it, it really is an honor to have you here and uh, I want to get right into it. So the psychology of COVID, let's talk, if we could, from your own perspective, um, what was your history with COVID? It, it erupted around the world in January of 2020. How long was it before you became concerned, maybe, that uh, we weren't really following the science? Yeah, well, um, at the end of February 2020, I wrote my first opinion paper in which, the, in which I warned, here in Belgium it was a, an opinion paper written in Dutch, in which I warned that the um, uh, anxiety for the, vi for the virus could be more dangerous than the virus itself. That was the title of the opinion paper. And it shows, I, I think it's good to be uh, entirely honest and open uh, to you. I, 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 from the beginning, uh, I took a critical perspective. So from the beginning, I had a feeling, I, 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 I studied the figures and the statistics, and I noticed immediately, or at least I had the impression immediately, um, that the dangerousness of the virus was overestimated. Uh, when I studied the mortality rates, the infection fatality rate, the case fatality rate, also the models of uh, uh, issued by Imperial College in London, which were the basis of the corona measures uh, worldwide, I think, or at least in Europe and in the States. Um, when I studied all these figures, graphs, statistics, and the math mathematical models, I immediately had the impression that the dangerousness of the virus was overestimated. And in my opinion, uh, by the end of May 2020, this was proven beyond doubt. For instance, um, the mathematical models uh, of Imperial College predicted that in a country such as Sweden, about 80,000 people would die. Uh, and Sweden, of course, is a very interesting case because it was uh, exceptional in, its, uh, in the corona measures it took because it didn't go uh, with the uh, lockdown strategy and, uh, and and stuff. So, but by the end of May, according to the models, by the end of May 2020, uh, at least 80,000 people should have died in Sweden. And uh, uh, by the end of May 2020, only 6,000 people died of COVID in Sweden. And these 6,000, that, that figure of 6,000 uh, was even reached uh, with a very enthusiastic uh, counting methods uh, that were used in the COVID crisis. Uh, I, I often use that word enthusiastic because indeed when the people dying from the flu uh, are counted, uh, usually um, they are counted in a much more uh, conservative way. Um, but anyway, by the end of May 2020, I had the feeling that for me, uh, it was proven beyond doubt if, if we looked at uh, figures and the, sta and the stats uh, and the models in this crisis that the dangerousness had been dramatically uh, overestimated of the virus. And um, uh, I noticed quite some other things as well. For instance, that at the moment, it became clear that the initial uh, mathematical models overrated um, the mortality rate of the virus or the mortality of the virus. At the moment, it became clear one would expect that uh, a narrative, a corona narrative, 
uh, that is based and that claims to be to have a scientific uh, basis or to have a, to to be based on scientific uh, models, you would expect that at the moment it becomes clear that the models were wrong, that at that moment the narrative and all the measures, the strategy that is based on the narrative would be corrected, of course. But that didn't happen. The narrative continued as if the models were right. And uh, the corona measures, the reaction to the coronavirus, remained by and large the same around the world. So that was one thing that was very striking to me at, uh, at that moment. And also, even more important, I think, uh, I noticed that in one way or another, uh, all the attention, the attention of the population of the entire society was really focused on one point in the world, on the danger of the um, coronavirus, of the, on the casualties, which the, the, the victims that could be claimed by the coronavirus. And it seemed as if all the rest did not exist anymore. For instance, from the beginning of the crisis, the United Nations and several other, other large uh, international institutions warned us that the number of people starving or dying from hunger in developing countries as a consequence of the lockdown strategies could be far higher and might probably be far higher than the number of people, uh, than the number of victims the virus could, cl could claim even if no measures were taken at all. So on the one hand, we have the dangerous of the virus. On the other hand, we have the collateral damage that can be caused by the corona strategy. And it seemed as if nobody really succeeded or in general, the population and the governments and stuff did not uh, manage to take both sources of danger into account. At any time we've seen in the, uh, in the mainstream media, really a comparison of the number of people that could die from the virus and the number of people that could die from the, from the, uh, from the corona measures. So, and that, that actually in itself is the most basic thing we sh uh, a society should consider. Mm -hmm. If you think about remedies for a disease, then the first thing you, you think about or you, you, or you try to know is whether the remedy will not be worse than, the, than, the, um, than a disease. And that didn't happen. So in one way or another, it seemed that people were so focused, the attention of people was so focused and so limited to, uh, to, to one specific limited aspect of reality um, that they didn't see uh, the other aspects or, uh, of reality anymore. And that was the moment around uh, May, in May 2020, I really started to, to shift uh, the perspective and to think uh, in the beginning of the crisis, I, I think and that I took in the, in the first, that I in the first place took a, a statistical perspective. I started to study the numbers, to, to study the graphs, um, uh, and so on. And then from May 2020 onwards, I had a feeling that that the the, uh, the core of the problem was not situated um, at the level of, a, of a, was not a biological problem, but that it was a psychological problem. And from then on, I started to think about how I could understand what was happening in society. How was it possible that a society um, went through a process um, uh, like this or, or didn't see anymore that um, uh, in many respects, um, the way we behaved uh, was absurd and uh, contraproductive. And it took me a few months before I could really, in my opinion, hit the nail and, 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 and started to understand that, what's, what, that what was happening in society was a, la a large scale process of crowd formation or mass formation, as, they, as, as, they, as, as we sometimes call it in psychology or in social psychology. Um, and uh, at, uh, looking when, when I think about it now, it seems strange to me that it took me so long because I had been lecturing on this process for, for quite some years before. And it shows me, I think, how difficult is it, it is uh, if uh, an entire population or an entire society is grasped in a certain strong psychological process, how difficult is it, it is as an individual to step back and to look from a distance and to understand what is happening. So, but um, around in, in August 2020, I wrote a, 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 an opinion paper on mass formation, and that was the moment when I when I really started to understand what what was happening in uh, at a psychological level. I think maybe it would be good if I describe this process of mass formation a little bit. Absolutely, let's talk about yes. that. What what so, is it? How does it get started? 
Yes, it's it's something that that emerges in a society when when very specific conditions are met. Um, for instance, the first and most crucial condition is that there should be a lot of people who experience a lack of social bond. So that's the most important thing. In, in by, uh, the, what do you mean by lack of social bonds? Lack of social bond. People should experience a lack of connectedness with other people. A lack of connectedness with other people. Um, but could you could you theoretically feel a lack of connectedness even though you're surrounded by people? Oh yes, of course, of yes. course. Okay. Yes, so this definitely. isn't just physical isolation, like in a. No, 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 not at all, no, no. not at all. No, okay. no, no, no. That means that it means that people people feel lonely and isolated in one way or another, not able to connect uh, emotionally to other people. Great. Uh, that's uh, that's essentially what, uh, what what I mean with the lack of social bond. And it was huge in the in the years before the Corona crisis. For instance, in the UK, uh, a, a minister was appointed, a, a loneliness minister, just to 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 focus on the problem of loneliness in society. And if if uh, also in the states. Um, um, the government mentioned that there was a loneliness epidemic. More than 50% of the people mentioned uh, that uh, they had no meaningful relationships at all in their life. That they were that they only uh, were connected, for instance, in the in the in the in the uh, on, through the internet or in the online world. That they only that only in the virtual space they dared to talk about their emotions and their problems, for instance. So there was really the loneliness was huge and that mm. it had been increasing throughout the last uh, decennia uh, 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 constantly. So on the one hand, we have this, this most crucial condition is the lack of social bond. And um, then a second one is also important, a lack of meaning making. The, the, the second one, the lack of meaning making actually follows from the first one. If people feel disconnected, if people don't have meaningful relationships, Social, if they are not embedded in a, in, a, in, a, in a social network, then they typically will experience their life and their jobs and stuff as meaningless. That's something very typical because human beings or social beings, um, when they lack social bond, they will also lack a feeling of uh, or, or an experience of meaning and sense in life. And for instance, also that can be very well uh, uh, illustrated through um, um, academic research. For instance, David Graeber wrote a book, Bullshit Jobs, in which he describes um, that 40% uh, of, the, of, the, of the population uh, had the experience in 2017, I think, 40% uh, of the people experienced their job as completely meaningless. And an additional, about 20%, I think, experienced uh, a, a strong lack of, 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 uh, of meaning. And if I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the Gallup World Poll, which found that um, worldwide, worldwide, only 13% of the people reported that they considered their job to be meaningful. Only 30%. And 63% said that they um, experienced their job as meaningless, that they sleepwalked through the office the entire day. So st stuff like that. It shows yep. that there was a radical lack of meaning making. Uh, for instance, at the level of the of uh, of, of people's jobs, yeah. Um, yeah. It, so the third sense, the sense yes. making though, if if we could, um, uh, this, uh, this matters to me a lot as somebody who considers himself rational and a scientist and all this other stuff. I, I've noticed that that a, a even prior to COVID, we were having difficulty with sense making. So of course, quick quick example. Um, environmental groups say we just have to decarbonize 50% by 2030. But if, as a scientist who studies energy, if you just run the math, the next question is, well, which half the population is going to die and which 70% of the jobs should go away? And there's no connection between those things, but it's pushed as an idea that's really important, but it doesn't ground. Is that, mm -hmm. is that where we lose our sense when, when we have these narratives that fundamentally don't even you, can't even, you can't even scratch at them with your fingernail without ruining them? Yes, there are many reasons why we experience this lack of sense making now. This 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 lack of sense making uh, has become stronger throughout the last two centuries. Actually, at this moment, I just finished a manuscript of a book, a book um, uh, in which I, in the first five chapters, described the psychological uh, evolutions throughout the last two uh, two centuries, and they they all like the the the, the throughout the last. Two centuries, the phenomenon of mass formation became increasingly strong, and it was exactly because people experienced um, uh, less and less social uh, uh, social bond, social connectedness, and less and less 
uh, sense making or meaning making in life that were two central conditions so it's quite complicated it's associated i think to the uh, mechanistic uh, view on man and the world which became more and more uh, predominant throughout the last two centuries um um, yes, but actually, I'm, I'm talking now about the situation, the psychological condition of the population before the Corona crisis, because right. you need you need these conditions um, in order for large scale mass formation to emerge in a society. So we had this lack of social connectedness, this lack of meaning making. And the third condition is very important as well, is that there have to be high levels of free floating anxiety in the population, free floating anxiety and free floating uh, uh, psychological discontent. And what uh, do I mean with free-floating anxiety? Free-floating anxiety is a kind of anxiety that is not connected to a mental representation, which is extremely important. Sometimes when we feel anxious, we know what we feel anxious for. When we see a lion, a dog, or something dangerous, and we are scared, then we know what we are anxious for. That means that mm -hmm. the anxiety is connected to a mental representation. And that means that we can mentally control the anxiety because we know what we are scared of. If we run away, we have a, from the lion, from the dog and so on, we have a, a certain feeling of being in control of our, of our anxiety. We know what we can do to avoid the object of anxiety. But sometimes people are confronted with a kind of anxiety that is not connected to a mental representation. And that is the most aversive mental state because it puts people in a situation when they feel where they feel entirely helpless because they don't know what they can run away of and so that's that's extremely important yes. do we know do we know professor um uh, that state, uh, I, I'm, I'm familiar and I've, I've, I've got my audience familiarized with the idea of the triune brain that, that we have these um, evolutionarily we had a core brain right so-called the reptilian brain on top of which another structure got slapped on top of which finally our our higher cortical thing got slapped and it's rather like starting with the dos operating system and ending up with windows it's a poor sort of a a, a match from time to time where does this free-floating anxiety reside is this is this one of our more archaic sort of uh is this down in our emotional centers meaning it's 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 somehow less subject or available to our cortical or rational centers where, where does it live in our in our brains Hmm, I don't think it's uh, it's something primitive. I think it's something very typical for the human being in this respect that for human beings, beings it's much more difficult than for animals uh, to make sense of their world because their, their psychological system works uh, 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 through language. People use language to understand their world and language is a system that never ends or that never leads to... Um, to clear-cut interpretations of the world. And that's something typical uh, for, for, for human beings. I think it's much more connected to our mental system, to the typically human mental system, uh, than through um, a certain archaic or, or, or old primitive uh, reactions. Um, but uh, uh, what, in any case, it was very clear that just before the corona crisis, the levels of uh, free-floating anxiety were extremely high. And for instance, one out of five uh, was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder before the crisis. One out of five. One out of five. So that's huge. And it, it, of course, 20% uh, um, of the people uh, received the diagnosis of an anxiety disorder, but much more people were confronted with anxiety and even much more were confronted with psychological discontent in general. Because mm -hmm. if you look in a, in a country such as Belgium, for instance, which has a population of 11 million people, each year... 300 million doses of antidepressants are used each year, 300 million doses, and only antidepressants. We are not talking about antipsychotics and all kinds of other psychopharmaceuticals, but that's huge. So, so you see that also that, and also that was deeply increasing the last, throughout the, uh, the last decennia. Uh, so the third condition was definitely met in our society. Uh, the, 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 it, it, and maybe you can answer this, because this has been a, a huge focus of mine. When I, I was wondering about where the onset of depression, what was called depression, was usually mid-40s. That was the average. But that bell curve is like four standard deviations, and it's all the way down in the low 20s now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then psychologists started to realize, oh, it's not actually depression because that's either situational or chemical. It's very, it's, it's amenable to treatment compared to this new thing, which wasn't amenable to treatment. So they started calling it demoralization. 
And what caught me was that that was defined as a loss of connection between your cognitive map and the world you are actually living in. Uh, they weren't okay. connecting yes. anymore, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's something that typically leads to this free-floating uh, effect, such as free-floating anxiety, frustration, and so on. Yes, typically. It's this disconnection, indeed, between the cognitive mapping of the world and, 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 and the world itself, you could say, between, between the symbolic and the real. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, so, yes. so that's already epidemic but even before COVID comes along. And, and what's the fourth condition? The fourth condition is uh, that there has to be a lot of free-floating aggression and frustration. And that also that follows, that follows from the first three conditions. If people feel socially disconnected and they feel that their life uh, uh, makes no sense or has no meaning, and they are confronted with a lot of free-floating anxiety and psychological discontent, that is hard to, to control mentally, then they will typically feel frustrated and aggressive. And all, the, all this free-floating frustration and aggression will also be without object. People will not know why they feel aggressive, but they will feel it or they will feel frustrated. And in this condition, something very typical, uh, uh, typical happens. People start to look for an object of, uh, or for a mental representation um, to which they can connect their uh, anxiety and their frustration. So, and then, if under these conditions, a narrative is distributed in society through the mass media, indicating an object of anxiety, and at the same time, providing a strategy to deal with this object of anxiety, something very specific happens, something very important. All this free-floating anxiety might connect to the object of anxiety indicated in the narrative. And people might be extremely willing to participate in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, which is indicated in the narrative. And in that way, that's the first stage that has a specific psychological advantage. All this free-floating anxiety is now connected to a mental representation. So, which means that people experience more psychological control in the situation. And then something, the next step is taken. Something happens at another level. Meaning, because many people participate in the same strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, a new kind of social bond emerges, a new kind of solidarity. So people feel connected again in a new way. And that's, that's actually, that's the most crucial thing. If you look at the Corona crisis and you listen at the main, uh, 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 you listen to the mainstream narrative, then you will hear that everything is about solidarity. You have to participate. You have to accept the vaccine. You have to respect social distancing because if you don't, you lack citizenship. Mm -hmm. Show no solidarity. So that's the most crucial thing always in mass formation. So that's the real reason, the real reason why people buy into the story, even if it is utterly absurd, is not because they believe in the narrative. It is because the narrative leads to the new social bond. That's the real reason. And then there is a fourth advantage all the frustration and aggression can be directed at an object. And that object is the people who, for one reason or another, do not want to participate in the mass formation. That's typically, historically, time and time again, we see the same process. When a population, for instance, the really large-scale mass formations, as they happened during the French Revolution, which were not very large, but they were large, the large-scale mass formations, which um, uh, uh, led to um, the emergence of uh, communism and Stalinism in, a, in a, the Soviet Union, the large-scale mass formations, which led to uh, Nazi Germany, to the, to the emergence of, uh, of, uh, of the totalitarian state in Nazi Germany, they all shared the same characteristics. The population was exactly, um, these four conditions will, were fulfilled, and then a new kind of solidarity emerged. And all the frustration and aggression was channeled by directing all the uh, by directing it at uh, at the people who um, who did not want to participate uh, or who couldn't participate uh, in um, in the mass formation. So, and then you have this very strange situation where 
people start from a very negative and diversive mental state. Lack of social bond, lack of meaning making, uh, free floating anxiety, and uh, a lot of frustration and aggression. They switch from this very highly aversive mental state to a symptomatic positive state where they feel connected, their life makes sense because they are all, uh, uh, life start to make sense again through this heroic struggle with the object of anxiety. People are united in their struggle against the coronavirus, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and their anxiety is connected to a mental rep representation and they can satisfy their frustration and aggression. So they, 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 that switch from a highly negative mental state to a positive mental state um, uh, brings people in a kind of mental intoxication. That's why people continue to believe in the narrative, even if it is utterly absurd. And, and you know, the measures, the corona measures, for instance, like the social distancing, the mask wearing, uh, uh, the vaccination strategies, they function for a certain part of the population. And I'm talking prob about probably about 30% of the population. It's not, it's not much more than that. Only 30% of the population usually is really into this process of mass formation, into this process of a collective hypnosis. Then there are an additional 40 or 50% who just go along with the masses, who will never, never go against the current because in one way or another, they think it's better not to do so. And then there is an additional 20%, sometimes 10%, it depends a little bit, who really uh, is not hypnotized at all and who also wants to speak out and do something to change the, the situation. But the first part of the population, the 30% who are really into the process of mass formation, mm -hmm. um, for these people, the more absurd the measures are, the more, the better they will work, the measures, and the more they will be inclined to buy into the narrative. That because the measures is this function, is, the bigger the bigger the lie, the better. Is that what we're talking about? Yes, here? indeed. Yes, but the, the, the measures really function as a ritual, and the rituals are a kind of behavior that has to be without pragmatic meaning, and that has to demand a sacrifice of the individual. Uh. By, par by participating in a ritual, an individual shows that the collective is more important than the individual, meaning that rituals have to be a kind of behavior that is without pragmatic meaning, that, leads, that has no advantages for, for people, no pragmatic advantages, and that uh, for which people has to sacrifice something. So that's, that's, that's a strange thing that for a certain part of the population, it really doesn't make a difference whether the measures are absurd or not. And that's, what, that's what's so strange for the people who are not in the process of mass formation, because they look and they see what's happening here. Do, do, do the people not see that, that, that what's going on is utterly absurd and that it is, it, it, it's even dangerous? Uh, but no, they won't, they be because... Uh, it, it, it's brilliant. This cuts right to the core of, um, like, this is how profound it is for me. So children, not at all really statistically, just not even touched by COVID, except for very few have some comorbidities. Actually, the science says they don't really transmit COVID all that well either because they have such high innate immunity to this thing. And yet there are people out there saying we need our children to be masked, even though there's no science to support the idea that the mask does anything, except it probably harms the child's cognitive and social development skills at a critical period of time. So people are willing ritualistically to sacrifice their children. Indeed. That's powerful to me. Is that what we're talking about? That's what we are talking about. Yes. That's exactly what we are talking about. And that's like, yes. So uh, this process of mass formation has some symptomatic advantages but it, 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 it has huge, huge disadvantages as well. And, and one of them is, the first is that the field of attention really gets very narrow. People only see what the narrative indicates. And that's something typical for hypnosis as well. When someone is hypnotized, uh, he will only be aware of the part of reality uh, uh, the hypnotist focuses on. And that's exactly the same in mass formation. So in mass formation, people are only aware of the part of reality, both cognitively and emotionally, uh, that is indicated by the, by the hypnotizing or by the, by the mass narrative. And that's, that's the reason why people don't seem to be aware um, of, the, of the collateral damage of the measures. And in one way or another, people know somewhere that there is collateral damage of measures, but it has no cognitive and emotional impact. That's the problem. It's, it, it's not, 
it's not there is no psychological energy attached to these mental representations and that's why they have no impact at all so people so will an hear. example yeah. might be it's it's incredibly incredibly awful worst thing ever that a 78 year old obese man with four other comorbidities died of covid that's terrible um, a 28-year-old whose gym was shut down, whose livelihood went away, who fell into a deep depression and then took accidentally a fentanyl overdose and they died. We ignore that. This is terrible, no. but that's not even, doesn't even impact us. Yes, it will have no impact. Exactly because when, the, when all this anxiety and all this frustration and all this aggression connects to this narrative that indicates an object of anxiety, all the psychological energy mm. is connected to this narrative. And what is not in the narrative is not, uh, 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 is not connected to psychological energy. And that's exactly why what is, the, the things that are not indicated by the narrative have no impact. They have no emotional or cognitive impact. They exist. People hear that there is collateral damage, but it will have no impact. No, that, that's you can understand that perfectly from a psychological perspective, and and it has a, also like there is a, there is a second problem. The process of mass formation, crowd formation, is similar, if not identical, to the process of hypnosis, and it also makes that people who are grasped in the process of mass formation are not aware of the egoistic disadvantages they suffer. So when someone is in mass formation, you can take everything away from this person, even his own life, he will not notice it. You can take his health away, his wealth away. You can take everything away. He might lose um, his future and his, and his, and his freedom. Uh, he will not be aware that he loses it. That's one of them. And you see exactly the same in hypnosis. The attention is so much focused on one point in a hypnosis through a simple hypnotic procedure that you can cut straight through people's flesh and bones, literally. With a simple hypnotic procedure, you can make someone radically insensitive to pain to this extent that you can perform a surgical operation on that person, that you can cut straight through the breastbone. The person will not notice it. That shows the power of, of, of hypnotic procedures and also of mass formation. And that was so striking from a historical point of view, uh, when historians uh, uh, saw what was happening in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, they felt like they have never been, they, they had never seen something uh, uh, like that before, because totalita a, total a totalitarian state and totalitarianism is something completely different from a classical dictatorship. It's something completely different. In a classical dictatorship, people are scared of the dictator because of his physical power. But in a totalitarian regime, everything starts with this process of mass formation. It, and it, it grasps people in the core of their being. It brings them under a kind of hypnosis. And that makes that, uh, that the totalitarian state has an extreme power over individuals, also over their private life and over their cognitive and mental functioning, which is it's completely different from a, from a classical dictatorship. And it's exactly because it is based on this process of mass formation or mass hypnosis. I'm, I want to I want to explore this. Uh, so, the relationship hypnosis and and mass formation. Hypnosis at the individual level, mass formation operating at the collective level across a culture. How many people are susceptible to hypnosis? Not everybody is. A lot are. A lot are. Okay. Usually, usually I think about eighty percent of the people. It depends a little bit. It depends a little bit. The extent. Of hypno the, the 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 depth of the hypnosis will not be the, the same mm -hmm. uh, for everyone. But in, in um, mass formation, usually only about 30% of the people is really is really uh, into the process of mass formation, not much more. Okay. And and for that 30%, is there any relationship between intelligence and susceptibility to that? Not at all. Hmm. Not at all. Really? No. And that's a strange thing. That's one of the major characteristics of a of a crowd or a mass. Uh, that everybody becomes as intelligent or <laughs> maybe better as stupid yes. <laughs> but, uh, but they are they are not they, and, and that, 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 that applies to highly intelligent uh, people 
uh, equally well as, uh, as to less intelligent people. Um, it, that, that has been studied in the 19th century already very extensively. It was very clear that uh, even the, the, the most intelligent people uh, were completely blind and completely insensitive to rational argumentation, for instance. Masses are only sensitive to strong visual images and to repetition of, a, of time and time again the same message. And uh, uh, also to, uh, to the presentation of numbers and graphs and statistics. If you, if you present numbers and statistics in a visual way, they will have a huge impact on the masses. Now, this is really near and dear to my heart because part of my work is I work with a lot of doctors who figured out early treatments and they're very flexible and creative and they've just been shut down and squashed. I know, I know people who consider themselves really intelligent, um, really successful individuals, also doctors uh, who still to this day in this country, if you get uh, COVID, you might end up in a hospital on remdesivir in a ventilator, even though we've known for 18 months that's a death sentence and it's not state of the art. And I know mm -hmm. people who will vigorously defend that that's the right thing to do because they're a doctor and they're all wrapped up in it. I don't know how, how, how do you mentally come back from that knowing that you've been a German in 1933 or you've been mm -hmm. Um, uh, a Jacobin at the Bridget Nantes, you know, uh, drowning people in in the French Revolution. Or you've once you've once you've gone there, how do you get back? That's a very good question. So it's extremely hard to undo a process of mass formation. That's very clear. Um, for instance, it, it's it's extremely hard to, to 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 wake someone up who is in a process of mass formation. But Gustave Le Bon, I don't know if you're familiar with Gustave Le Bon. He wrote a very important book on uh, on mass formation in the 19th century, uh, the psychology of the crowds, it, it was called. And he describes already there that uh, if the people who are not in in the mass formation try to wake up the people who are in a mass formation, uh, then they will be confronted probably with failure. They will uh, uh, be confronted with the fact that that that. They are unable to, 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 to wake up the masses, but he says, nevertheless, it is extremely important to continue to speak out because if people continue to speak out, the hypnosis might become less deep and it will become less deep. Uh, Gustave Le Bon uh, presents several historical examples of uh, situations in which, in which uh, um, uh, people who were awake continued to speak out um, and prevented the masses from committing atrocities because that's typically what masses do. Because uh, one function of the mass formation is um, um, the satisfaction of all this frustration and aggression, you know, the fourth condition. Masses typically, typically have the inclination to show the tendency to, um, to commit atrocities. And they typically do it uh, 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 being convinced that they perform an almost sacral pledge, and that some, that, 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 that they, they do something that is that is a, that is a really their duty, and that 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 has to do with the fact that uh, people in mass formation are convinced uh, that what they do is for the greater good, for the for for the well-being of the collective, uh, but they forget, of course, that it is for for the well-being of a certain collective and at the disadvantage of a, of a, of another of another part of the population. But anyway, so uh, it's hard to wake the masses up. Uh, the only thing, but, but, but if you continue to speak, uh, the 30% of the population who is really into the process of mass formation, uh, or, uh, you, well, you will make the hypnosis less deep uh, in this uh, part of the population, and you might prevent um, um, the masses from, from committing atrocities. So it's extremely important to continue to speak out. Uh, that's the most important thing, I think. I want to ask a question about, about the how about going about speaking out, because if, if I heard how we got into this, there was repetition, there was ritual, there was um, that hypnotic sort of getting people in. So we know how hypnotists wake people back up again, right? So, so they bring them back out into their larger, out of the narrow focus, out again. To me, what, what, so, uh, and by the way, this is my entire work in the world now is trying to like help wake us up in time mm -hmm. uh, to prevent those atrocities from getting worse than they've already been. Uh, so an idea I have is, is, to, is to use uh, repetition. And here, here's, my, here's my highest thing. If we can just back it up a bit, we can say, listen, I'm no public health expert, but if I was one, my highest goal would be reducing mortality. Like my efforts either made things worse or made things better. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get involved with whether the vaccines work or people died with COVID or of COVID. Let's just back up. And I can tell you that right now in the United States, all-cause mortality is running way above even last year, and it's mm -hmm. way above where it should be. So I can say, hey, um, 
I think we're failing at this and we should do better. Mm. That's an open question, you know, just put it out there. But if we had multiple people actually pushing on that, like different, different, I know lots of other thought leaders and people who have big platforms and large following. So if we all started saying that same thing, I'm just wondering if it, messaging, would that be effective? If we started pushing on one scratchy sort of a unanswerable question? Yes, that will be effective to a certain extent. I believe so. Yes, definitely. What? Okay, fantastic. But we should, not, the- we, we, should, we should not immediately a very large, uh, expect a very large effect. I, th- I think I think it. I think we will we will be able to wake up someone here and there, or uh, but uh, but uh, not not the large portions of the population. I think, but it's extremely important. That's exactly how we have to do it. I think just try to talk in an as sincere and honest way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, try to continue to speak out. Uh, try to continue to make sure that uh, there is a dissonant voice in in, uh, in the public space. That's extremely important because if you look historically, for instance, you can see that it was exactly at the moment that the opposition was silenced in public space, that there was no dissonant voice anymore in in in, uh, in, um, in public space, that um, the totalitarian states uh, started to commit uh, their absurd atrocities. Uh, that happened in 1930 in, um, in uh, uh, the Soviet Union and around 1935 in Nazi Germany. At that moment, the opposition was completely silenced, was completely erased in public space. And at that moment, the system really turned absurd. For instance, Stalin in the Soviet Union, he started to kill no matter who. In the end, he killed he killed 50% of his own uh, of his own party members who usually hadn't done anything wrong. So, um, yeah. and that, that that's something typical. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, a, a German Jewish philosopher, philosopher who wrote this wonderful book, uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, she says that at the moment, um, uh, opposition, uh, the opposition is radically silenced in public space. At that moment, the totalitarian state becomes a monster that divorces its own children. That's exactly what she says. Mm. The totalitarian system becomes a monster that divorces its own children at that exact moment. So it, that shows us again that something radically different from a classical dictatorship. In a, when a classical dictator uh, manages to silence the opposition, he usually will become more friendly because this guy, a classical dictator, has a certain tactical awareness. He knows that at the moment he is in charge and at the moment he really uh, overcame all opposition. He knows that at that moment, it's important for him to show the population that he will be a good leader. <laughs> That's what he realizes. But in a, in, a, in, a total, in a totalitarian state, which is based on this process of, 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 of sleep and, and, and hypnosis, um, the totalitarian leaders are not aware or, or do not have the... The brain at that moment to just know that it will be to their own disadvantage if they, if they, if they continue uh, to commit atrocities. But that's exactly what they do. Even it even gets much worse once they are once they really have or the only voice in public space. So it's so it's so important to understand that difference between classical dictatorships and totalitarian processes. For instance, also totalitarian leaders typically are also hypnotized by their own voice and their own theory. Hmm. They are hypnotized, Gustave Le Bon says that, Hannah Arendt says, uh, says it uh, as well, they are hypnotized by their own ideology, meaning that they do not believe what they tell the people, but they are so convinced that what they are trying to do in society, that the ideology that they are trying to impose to society is will bring society to a kind of paradise. They are so convinced that what they are doing is the good thing, that they feel that it is justified to lie, to cheat, to manipulate, and so on. That's typically, but they are absolutely ideologically hypnotized. They are hypnotized by their ideology. That's a, something that is radically different also from classical dictatorships. And if I could, yes. um, so uh, much to the to the chagrin of, of, I think, many in the profession, we, we saw that uh, psychologists worked on nudge units in the UK and in Australia and probably New Zealand, probably the US. But, but these were psychologists who said, hey, government, we're going to help you dial up the fear 
so that you can get people to do the things you want them to do. And of course, the government is believing, I think you're right, it, it feels right to me that the government, the officials in this, they believe this is the right thing to do. They know that. We know they're using actual techniques that have been honed and developed. I mean, you read the 1928 book by Bernays, it's, it's already a fairly comprehensive superstructure of how you go about doing this. I'm sure as, as, as inelegant as phones were in 1928 compared to today, I'm going to bet the technology, the understanding, the, the neuro-linguistic mapping, the, the, the psychological processes, I bet we understand those better. Um, so, so this feels a little bit like there is an agenda, but I got to be honest, it's actually only really being run in the Western countries at the level I see it being run. So that's the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, and Europe. I don't see India struggling with this at this point in time. Would would you agree, or or does this feel like it's kind of localized to Western That's societies? Maybe, at this point? maybe. I think what happens now is that many of our, of the of our leaders are convinced that we need to move from a, a a democratic system to a technocratic system. I think that most of the people are convinced that this is the only solution for the unsolvable problems we are facing now. And I think at that level, they really believe that they do the right thing. Mm. So I think they, they are convinced that uh, if we want to deal with climate change, with the corona, with, with, with the pandemics, with, with all kinds of other uh, uh, problems, we need to move from a democratic to a technocratic system. And that's why they, I think that many of them are so convinced that they indeed feel that it is justified to use psychological techniques such as nudging and so on. Uh, um, uh, to 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 make people believe in the narrative and to 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 convince them to go along with the narrative to buy into the narrative. I think that's what happens. I think we have to distinguish between the, the level of ideology and the level of the narratives that are distributed in the in the uh, uh, in society. I think that our leaders believe that at the ideological level they do the right thing. They even uh, choose for the only uh, possible solution. And I think that many of them will not really believe in the narratives they are distributing. I think that many of them will consider the narratives as a kind of an instrument to, uh, uh, to, to make the ideology happen. So I, I, think, I think that's about what happens. Uh, I don't think that is, that it, that it, yeah, I'll find out. Yeah, I, th I think something like that happens. Um, okay, this is, this is absolutely brilliant. So, so I, I think we're at the heart of this now for, for me and my understanding where I'm at in the development of understanding this. So what I'd like to do is try and understand it from their perspective. So uh, they sleep at night, they believe they're doing a higher order good, maybe there's some self interest and some power and some usual ego and greed and stuff like that wrapped in always is hey, we're humans, but, but they believe in on some level in this larger story which if I listen to the Davos crowd, they tell me specifically that they're very concerned about something that I think is real, which is that by 2050, we'll need three planets of resources and we only have one, right? And there's mm -hmm. an issue there. We, we know that we're at this really unusual part of our species development where we've kind of grown into the edge of our Petri dish. And now we got to you know, go to a, a plan B. Their plan B though is technological nirvana, this technocracy. Um, so I, I can only imagine like, Fauci, I can get my head around Fauci. He seems really committed to the idea that everybody needs to be on this vaccine program and that that's the only way, like to the exclusion of every other possible measure. It's all about getting everybody right down to infants on a vaccine program. So if I put myself in his head, he must believe at least on some level, leaving aside money and power, that that is a right thing to do. Mm. That, that that brings us yes. somewhere yes. we should go. I think so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But it's dangerous, of course. It's not because people believe that you're doing the good thing that you are not dangerous. No, no, oh. no. It's it it, it lacks yes. all humidity is uh, humility, which is um, that you know. Guess what? These are complex systems. They have emergent behaviors. We can't predict what's going to happen. Da, da, da. Exactly. But I, I, I think they think they can control everything. Control. Yes. Um, yes. 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 Everything yes. and yes. get a predicted outcome at the back end of, of that. Of course. Yes. Well, 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 from from a from a a science point of view, this idea of being able to control everything is absurd. As you, you, yes. you refer to complex dynamical systems, uh, to the emergence of complex dynamical systems, we all know that complex dynamical systems are unpredictable in the, in the chaotic phase. They have this characteristic yes. of determin deterministic unpredictability. Lawrence, Edward Lawrence wrote this wonderful paper on deterministic un unpredictability of complex systems. They should read it all. And then, then they should realize that they started something that will lead up to only one thing, 
to self-destruction. And mm -hmm. that's exactly, that's exactly what uh, people like Le Bon and Arendt already described, that totalitarianism always destroys itself, always. And then, because it is, it, it, it's, it's, well, it's so important to realize because the people who do not buy into the narrative, who do not go along with the narrative and who wonder what they can do, we just gave them the advice that they have to try to continue to speak out. That's one important advice. But the second one is that the best strategy always is non-violent resistance. Always. That's the best strategy. Because every kind of violence used against the system will be used as a justification uh, uh, for the aggression and, uh, and, uh, and the frustration to channel the aggression and the frustration to that group. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the second thing is that the group who doesn't buy into the narrative does not have to destroy the system. The, the, the system always destroys itself. Always. It's, self, it's intrinsically self-destructive. But it can take a while, of course. And then that's why um, it's very often necessary to uh, establish a kind of parallel structures that, that allow uh, uh, people to, to, to survive more or less or a little bit independent, independent from the system. Um, but, uh, well, yes, I agree uh, completely with that 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 that, that uh, uh, people can think they can control processes as the ones that are happening now but they can't definitely not science shows this uh in 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 in, in yeah in the most clear-cut way um yep it's it's an absolute guarantee i love this idea of parallel structures uh and, and uh that's what i do with with my tribe as i call us uh, we we are practicing with those parallel structures but to me the steps are one, you have to be aware that this is happening because that's that's my first line of defense. So when I read nudging articles, right? So um, here's one from uh, the Omicron variant just came out a few days ago. And um, I'm looking here at a, at a PBS article. It reads first, first, first sentence, worried scientists in South Africa are scrambling to combat the lightning spread across the country of a new and highly transmissible Omicron variant is the world grapples. Those are all leading, leading, leading terms to me. Those are all emotionally charged. And they're, they're, mm. like you say, they're ungrounded. It's just sort of free floating. Look at all that anxiety, mm. lightning speed, blitzkrieg, mm. fire is mm. scrambling, you know, and it's just, mm. and it turns out I called up some doctors in South Africa and I said, what are you dealing with? And they're like, it, it seems mild. You know, it's like, like, I can, I can perform better journalism than these people, but they're caught. Whoever wrote this is caught. Nobody had to mm. teach this person to write it that way, did they? Mm, no. no, they just knew, right? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So step one is, if I can see that happening, I, I can be immune from it. And then step two is, I think we got to find each other and, and come together so we're not tons Connect. of little voices. Yeah. Connect. Because that's mass formation emerges in a disconnected society. So people have to be socially atom atomized, uh, uh, Hannah Arendt called it. So they have to be yeah. socially isolated. There, there has to be a lack of social bond. But once mass formation is established and once a totalitarian thinking emerges in a society, it makes the social isolation even much worse. That's very typical. Um, uh, in, in, in a totalitarian state, um, uh, Arendt says, there is only one bond that is allowed. It is the bond between the the state and the individual, but not between the individuals. So totalitarianism typically um, destroys all the social bonds between individuals. And that's why we have to do, try to do the opposite. We have to try to connect with each other, to try to connect as much as possible, definitely. So speak out um, uh, and uh, connect with each other. Um, that are two very important, uh, two, two extremely important uh, things. Yes. Yeah, so... Uh, it will pass on its own, though. It, um, I think Charles McKay, to paraphrase badly out of memory, said that it, it has been seen that men um, think in herds and they go mad in herds, but they will recover their senses only slowly and one by one. Something yeah. like that, right? So Something like you, that. You can feel this mass psychosis. Um, as we come into uh, the last part of this, I'm curious, because a lot of this feels intentional to me. Your 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 estimation is how much of this looks intentional versus this is just how it goes. It's a mixture between the two. 
Mm -hmm. I think, as always, as always. And I think people typically have the inclination to overestimate the intentional part. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean, of course, that there is no intentional part. I'm, I, I, I'm also, I, I, I agree with you. And I also believe that um, uh, many uh, experts and leaders now know that the vaccination strategy actually doesn't really work or that, that at least uh, it, it doesn't, didn't bring us what, uh, what we could expect. Many experts know that uh, uh, face um, uh, mask wearing actually uh, uh, doesn't lead to less um, contamination. So for instance, and sometimes the experts also tell this uh, in the mainstream media. I remember one virologist here in Belgium saying that uh, the, the mask wearing is a symbolic measure because it remembers people uh, um, every day that there is a pandemic and they and that they should um, uh, go along with the with the with the, with the, with the measures or that they sh should uh, stick to the measures. So I think people know it indeed, but I think that again, I think what these people still believe that maybe this vaccine didn't, doesn't work, but in the end, uh, um, it will be the best for everyone if people get vaccinated uh, three times a year. Um, uh, so this 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 this, this ideological fiction, this belief that uh, we should replace a nature through an artificial system, natural immunity through an artificial system. This is so typical for, for totalitarianism. This was typically, maybe people are not aware of that, I think, but that is what totalitarianism is. Totalitarianism always tries to establish an artificial world in an artificial society, which can be entirely rationally controlled and manipulated. Um, uh, th th that is uh, the ultimate goal of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a certain uh, mechanistic ideology, which is also the basis of totalitarianism. Because, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so th I, I do believe that uh, the experts know that many of the measures and stuff uh, don't really work, but I think they are still convinced that their system and their ideological approach of, of, of society um, uh, will be the best uh, ever. I, I think, uh, um, and in the end, it becomes entirely absurd, of course, because in the end, they are willing to sacrifice 50% of humanity to re or even 100% uh, to make their ide ideological fiction real. And that's the the absurdness of uh, of yeah. um, of uh, of this kind of thinking. Yes. Yeah. Well. Well. The COVID measures don't work from a public health standpoint. That's clear. Um, you know. And as they say in the military, once is an accident, twice is coincidence, but three times is enemy action. But if you dare point out uh, that that that's the case, you'll find yourself censored, marginalized, maybe lose a job. Mm. This happens a lot. So there is a high cost to speaking up. Oh yes, of course. Know. Yes. Um, yes. It would you is this just do we just have to bear that cost because that's the times we live in or is there a way to split the difference or because I know a lot of people losing jobs out of all of this. Um, yes, as they speak up. You know, the ancient Greeks knew knew already that uh, speaking the truth is always dangerous because you can define truth as that part of knowledge that. Uh, is in conflict with public discourse. The ancient Greeks considered it like that. As soon as a narrative um, uh, is dominant in public space, you will start to, to feel that the narrative is incomplete and that in one way or another, um, 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 someone should say in public space that there is a problem with dominant narrative. And the ancient Greeks knew that the one who tells it, the one who, who tries to say what everybody feels, but, 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 but that nobody dares to say, that person is in danger. So, and that's what, that, that's what the ancient Greeks considered uh, speaking the truth. And it means, they called it parasia. Uh, so a, a kind of speech which uh, um, consists of just telling that something that everybody feels that it should be told, but that nobody dares to say. And if you do that, you're in danger. That's true. And I think we, we, should, we should continue to try to do it because uh, the better you understand what is happening, the more you see that actually there is no other option. There is no other option. If we shut up, we will be in danger as well. People mm -hmm. who now go along with the narrative, people who now go along with the narrative do not realize 
at the danger they expose themselves to. They, they, they have no idea what's awaiting them. And it, it, could, could we even say that, that, that as, as expensive as it is now to speak up, it'll be more expensive if you yes, wait? Yes, definitely. Yes. That's one more thing. And it, of course, I think we have to be careful and we have to be as polite and as friendly as possible. And I think we, we do not only have to speak for ourselves, we also have to speak for the people who believe in the narrative. Because in the end, it will be clear that uh, they need a dissonant voice. And, and, and that, 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 that mm. without this dissonant voice, the system will close and, and will become radically self-destructive. And I, I think in, maybe we can also learn something from them at certain points. I mean, but we have to try to establish an, an open conversation as much as, pos as possible in society. And, that, and we have to do that for everyone, not only for ourselves, but also for the people who are into the mass, hip or the, the mass phenomenon. Because in the end, they are human beings as well. Yeah. And... Um, yeah. So with compassion, I, I, I'm often saying that, that uh, for the people who've, who've gone off that into the mass psychosis, when, not if, but, but when they come back, I'll welcome them. There's not going to be big, ugly lessons learned, rubbing their noses in it kind of thing. Like, let's listen, can we just, uh, everybody has to be welcomed back into this, into reality, as I call it at this point. So the reality, yes. we face huge predicaments, a problem has a solution, a predicament, just you have to manage the outcome. We're facing huge predicaments economically ecologically we've got energy issues mm. like big things that we really need our best minds on and we need full we have to have the ability to have uncomfortable conversations right mm. it's like and if we can't even do that around something as simple as should people take vitamin d or not you know without that somehow becoming you know uh, against the the state narrative i think we're in trouble so i really think this is important you know to me tell me if you disagree but what's at stake is literally everything. Yes. I like living in an abundant, well-functioning society. I think that mm -hmm. could all break if we mismanage this to the point that our currency collapses because we didn't figure out how to close the gap between the debts we have and the liabilities we have in reality. If we don't do that on our own terms, it'll come on nature's terms. And I don't like that. I'd rather do this um, consciously and elegantly. So I mm -hmm. think that's what's at risk to me everything yes i agree i agree um yes definitely and that's that's exactly this this the, the ultimately um, mass formation always destroys the core of the human being mm. it destroys the humanity in the human being and so we are human i think as long as we try to speak to each other yeah and yeah. When that that that's the use of language and the establish uh, establishing a social bond through speech is what characterizes a human being and what makes it different from uh, other living beings. And I think that's what we have to try to represent. We have to try to represent humanity in this crisis and to try to prevent um, uh, that uh, uh, humanity disappears. And we have to do it just by trying to continue to speak, to be respectful to the other people, to, be, to, to give them the right to have their own opinion, to even give them the right to be in a mass phenomenon, to be in a ma in mass formation. But by just telling them, we will try to continue to speak to you. And we will try to continue that there are people who think differently, that there are people who, who, who uh, uh, look at it from a different perspective. Uh, we have to be as sensitive as possible, as honest as possible, as sincere as possible. But uh, that's the only solution, I think, or that's the only uh, way to prevent the system uh, to close and to destroy everything. Um, which I will, I don't believe it will. I, I, I really, I'm really optimistic in this sense. I believe that there will be a group of people who manage to continue to speak out and who will bring change in, 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 in this situation. But I'm, 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 I'm not naive in this respect that the next years will be very tough years, I think. Uh, mm. um, but well, we know what to do, I think. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah. Oh. yeah. This is uh, the good that's come out of COVID for me is I've, I've found people like yourself, like the Pierre Corey, like all the, all the doctors out there who, who are really speaking that truth to power, even though, um, it costs 
So we find who has integrity, we find who has moral courage, we find who's intellectually honest in this story. And, that, and that's wonderful. Mm. Um, that's very good because because we and need this, to find each yeah. other as a first step. Yes. And and this is when a great reshaping, ha- I think good things, we can come out of this better. Um, the fact that 11 million people in Belgium are consuming 300 million doses of antidepressants in a year tells us there are things we can improve upon. Yeah. So that's the hope, the hope I have and, and the opportunity in the story is that we can do better. I think we can. Yes, indeed. And that is the real problem. The real problem is not the virus. Maybe the virus is also a problem. And definitely, if you die of the virus, it must be terrible and so on. That's, it's not about that. But, but the real problem um, we try to find a solution for without knowing it is this psychological discontent and this psychological misery the society was in before the crisis and the crisis and this narrative on the coronavirus was a symptom was a symptom of the real problem which was actually the psychological um, state of the population which in its turn was connected to our view on man and the world our mechanistic view on man and the world, our, our mechanist, materialist view on man and the world. That's the real problem. A view on man and the world that actually is not scientific at all. Because if you look at sci- the science of the last 150 years, it exactly showed us that we are not a biological machine and that the universe is not a mechanical system. Far from that. It's a system that is aware, that is conscious, a system that reacts to our consciousness. Mm-hmm. That's that's the real revolution, I think, um, that has to happen, that the old view on man and the world is replaced uh, by a view uh, that is different. And that's... Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. This is, uh, this is where I've come to as well, is this idea that... Um, that these might well be birthing pains, but this isn't. This is this is the moment where humanity, our consciousness, gets to come forward and understand that consciousness consciously interacts with itself and what this stuff we call matter and reality. It's it's a huge awakening. And for instance, we, yeah, and nature's been running this experiment for a while. So either we step up to the plate and, and into our full potential, um, no. or or we don't. Uh, but that's literally what's at stake here is is uh, is probably the most worthy thing of all is to be a participant in um, a really incredible moment of evolution. And so maybe that's a lot of this is, is, um, is just how it goes, right? There's, there's, it's, this is, uh, getting born is never easy. I exactly. Guess. And that, that's also why, personally, I don't think that ultimately what we are dealing with is a conspiracy it's an ideological problem that's what i believe ultimately of course people conspire from time to time and so on but ultimately we are dealing with a with a problem at the level of of a, of our of an we are dealing with an ideological problem i think people are grasped in a certain ideology a certain view on man and the world uh, and it is this view on man and the world that is the real problem in, in this situation that's uh-huh. what i believe I believe yeah. so too. So, so the framing then becomes that those who are want to give us this technocratic future they envision, to them, the dichotomy is they they say it's it's this future progression. This is where we were always going. But in fact, they're trying to hold us back into a very old ideology, mm-hmm. which is not the one we need. So it, that's the fundamental tension in that story is that it's it's inaccurate. Um, yeah, and the- they're promising us everything while delivering us the past. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work. Fantastic. So, how do how do I help you? How does my tribe help you? Where, what do you tell me about this book you're writing? And um, and I know people are going to want to follow you more closely after this and um, find out what you're saying and thinking. So, how do we do that? I well, you 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 help me already now by just uh, giving me the opportunity to speak and to to bring my 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 story here or my view on this problem. So that's one very important thing, I think. Mm-hmm. And if you want, you can invite me another time when I finish the book. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> finished. It, Done. It's finished. It, it will be published in January. It is finished now, but it still has to be translated in, uh, in English because I wrote it in Dutch. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And what's the title? The Psychology of Totalitarianism. Beautiful. 
That's oh. going to be, yep. We'll have you right back on because uh, I will have a lot of people interested Wonderful. in that on, on my end. No. Absolutely. Well, um, doctor, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your work in the world. And uh, this has been a fabulous conversation and I really do plan to have uh, follow up with you very soon. So thank, thank you very much for inviting me and for listening.